Back when I was a kid, NASA was still sending rockets to the moon. Yeah, Saturn V rockets, and they looked something like this. Immense rockets that would burn lots of fuel, extremely expensive, took thousands of people to operate. But strangely, when it would first launch, like you see in this photograph from NASA, it would launch at a glacial pace. It was barely lifting off of that launch pad. Slow, cumbersome, until it really got some momentum going. Uh, compare that to what my dad and I used to fly. That was an Estes rocket. It was just a model rocket, had a little engine in it like this. And what would happen is it would shoot up extremely fast off of that launch pad, much less expensive, took only one or two people to be able to run it, and very, very fast. Well, you might say, James, are we going to really be talking about rockets in this particular nugget? No, we're going to be talking about containers, but they have a lot of similarities to these two types of rockets. Although, you'll be glad to know, it doesn't actually involve rocket science. So what we're really talking about here is not launching rockets, but launching apps. And that's a big part of what we work with when we're talking about containers. It could be a service. Uh, very often it's an app. It might be you, you have developers that are custom testing applications and they want a kind of a protected environment to do it. In. And you want to keep the expense low. That's why we might do something like using containers. First though, let's take a look at a couple of other options. Uh, one option would just be use bare metal. That's how we always used to do it. You just have a single machine. It would be a one-to-one -one use of bare metal. You'd have a single, you know, one operating system installed on here. Then you would install one or more applications. It's got a very high expense uh, compared to what it can do here. And it's got difficult recoverability. I mean, if everything fails, you know, say the operating system fails, or let's just say the application that you've installed on here that you're, you're testing or whatever, uh, let's say that that were to crash and burn. Well, very often, you'll have to reinstall the application. You might have to reinstall the operating system if it has a problem. If there's a hardware issue here, you have to replace a hard drive. You know how it goes. Lots of different kind of stuff here in terms of the recoverability, not really the the best option. We still use it sometimes, but not the best. And we also have the lowest flexibility with this because we can't just go back in time unless you were to do something like tape backups back in the old days, you know, or some kind of a backup solution to where if something went wrong here, we could go back to a previous point in time and go back to the way things were. But it's very cumbersome in terms of the recoverability because it takes a long time to restore from backup. By the way, tape backups actually are having a, a resurgence. Very low flexibility as well with these things. And the apps are not portable. So I've got an app installed on here. And what if I wanted to move it to a different machine for whatever reason? Maybe we're reworking some things in our IT or whatever. But if I wanted to move that app to another another um, operating system, another host, very often I'd have to stand up another whole server, install another operating system, install my app onto here, you know, and, and do the whole thing all over again. And then we have virtual machines. Now, virtual machines are going to take us a step further. We're going to have one to N higher density. So in other words, however many virtual machines I can stuff onto this piece of hardware is how many we can have. It's only limited by storage, CPU, amount of memory we have. And there's some practical limitations in terms of how much you want to put on a single machine. But a lot of, a lot of servers will have dozens of virtual machines, sometimes hundreds of virtual machines there, depending upon the hardware. Now, when we've done that, we get lower expense, right? Because we have dozens, let's say dozens of virtual machines on a single piece of hardware, less electricity, less maintenance, less storage space, less room in the rack, the whole thing. You get the idea. And we've talked about some of this before. Also, much easier recoverability. We talked about how we can do things like live migrations with Hyper-V, how we can use uh, clustering with Hyper-V. So maybe we decided to make this one also, you know, maybe it's a cluster even, you know, uh, we can fail this over. So if this machine were to have some problem, for example, we could fail over to this other uh, Hyper-V host that we have here um, in clustering. So it's also very, very flexible. You can move these quite easily. You can use live migrations. We talked about that again also previously when we discussed Hyper-V here. Now, of course, you know your products are generally going to be Hyper-V, VMware. There's a couple of others out there as well, but those are probably the, the biggest players there. And keep in mind, though, they're still relatively thick. Uh, we, we have to have an entire operating system per virtual machine. This virtual machine is not both Linux and Windows. Okay? I don't know if you can even read that. That's supposed to say Linux. Okay. Anyway, uh, Linux and Windows, you can't do that. You can't say, you have to pick one or the other, right? So it's going to be either Linux or Windows. Also, and I forgot to mention this, the apps are not portable here either. Okay. So if I have an app on this virtual machine here, it's difficult to disentangle it 
from the operating system of that virtual machine and just kind of stuck it, you know, stick it over here. And when we take a look further on in containers, we're going to see that that's a little bit easier. Now, with virtual machines and bare metal, we're, you know, virtual machines for sure are still the Saturn V rocket. You know, lots of resources, very expensive and all that stuff. Virtual machines are better. Maybe it's a smaller Saturn V rocket. But what we really want to get to is to the Estes rockets of application development. And that would be something called a container. These have an even higher density than virtual machines would have. It's the lowest expense. It's a very thin platform and it gives you very easy versioning and recoverability. Let me kind of talk about what this is. So what we would have is we would still have an operating system here. So this might be Windows. In our case, it's going to be Server 2022. Now, that being said, uh, these would be applications that can borrow from, I'll illustrate this in a different graphic here coming up, but they all can borrow from that same operating system, but the applications kind of run independently there or on top of it. Uh, and it's much easier to move them around and to do different versioning of those applications. So with a with the virtual machine, if I had an application in a certain state and I liked the way it was looking and everything, well, I'd have to take a snapshot of the whole virtual machine. I can't kind of just snapshot only the app. With containers, you can do that. So very easy versioning, and it's also much easier to recover, probably as a result of that. And very fast startup. This is my Estes model rocket that shoots way up really fast instead of the Saturn V that barely gets off the launch pad, okay? Very fast startup, usually within a sometimes a second or two uh, to start these things up. Compare that to any Windows operating system, which a lot of times it's a minute. And it also loads a lot of stuff you don't really need. That's why it's really nice that this is a thin platform. Because when you're loading Windows, what, do you, what happens when you start up even a Windows 10 or 11 machine, not, not, not to mention a server? It's loading things you don't really need. What if you'd never planned to print from that server? Well, it still has a print engine there. It still has print drivers. Uh, what if you don't plan to you know, play all kinds of fancy games or do Bitcoin mining? Well, it still has video drivers, and video drivers are very complicated, uh, probably the most complicated drivers you'll have on your system. So there's a, there's a lot of things you don't really need in a full virtual machine, but with containers, it's really mostly just the container, and it borrows a little bit of kernel from the operating system. The apps are also portable, easy to move around. We don't really do that much in this particular nugget or this discussion, but it is easy to move them around. And we can isolate them from the host in a couple of different ways. One of those would be something called process level isolation. Neither one of these is better than the other. It just depends on what your purposes are. And if you're a developer or you're developing applications, depending upon kind of what stage you're in, in the application development. Okay, let's take a look first of all at this one on top. This would be our process isolation. I'll put PI there, process isolation. So what happens here is you have your base hardware. We're always going to have that, right? Then you have your operating system. Let's say it's a Windows 11 or 2022, okay? And you could do this on clients, by the way. Uh, you don't have to have an expensive license for, you know, data center server or something like that. Windows 10 works fine. Windows 11 works fine. Most of your developers will probably use one of those. And then what happens here is we'll have the kernel. Now the kernel, of course, is part of the operating system. It's the base level of the operating system. And when we have our apps, libraries, our, you know, basically our container, everything that's contained in our container, it has to borrow from that kernel. So there's, you know, pieces of the kernel in each one of these apps that we're having here. Now notice the density there as well. For these three apps, uh, I don't have to build a separate virtual machine for each one of those either. And these might all be different versions of the app. If I have three versions of an app running on a Windows machine, in, you know, in a conventional sense, sometimes that's kind of hard to do because when you install one, it overwrites the other or it upgrades the other, whatever. Here I can have different versions of the app that I'm kind of testing, for example, or different stages of my development. Uh, and they're all, they're all isolated from one another. There's this kind of this iron wall between the, you know, each one of these, they're sandboxed, if you will, uh, and they don't interfere with one another. Now, there is still a little bit of something that's shared there. Remember the kernel? Yeah, that's being shared between all three of them. So if the kernel, maybe we did an update or something, and the kernel now has some really, really bad, you know, bug in it. You know, that's supposed to be a bug. It's more like Sputnik or something. But anyway, uh, it has a bug in it. Now it could, of course, affect all three of these containers up here. Or uh, this is another situation, and that's just something you have to live with sometimes. The other part of that would be, what if one of these apps interfered with the kernel in uh, just a certain way, and it kind of crashes this kernel? Well, now... It's going to affect all of my other containers here potentially as well. Later on, you might want more isolation. And if that's the case, 
you might want to use something called Hyper-V isolation. Let's take a look at what that's about. So here we have the, the bottom of this is the same. The hardware, you got to have that. The operating system, got to have that. But now we're also adding into this uh, layering Hyper-V as our hypervisor, okay? So now what will happen here is that if we're going to do that method, then each one of these will get a dedicated kernel, not a shared kernel. This, year, this kernel up here was shared. Everybody had to participate in it. These, the, the hypervisor is able to kind of copy out the kernel into each one of these containers in an isolated fashion so that they don't have to share and that each one of these gets their own, you know, bits in the kernel. Now, this is going to reduce the density a little bit because when each one has their own kernel, it requires more memory, it requires more hard drive space. But they're still, even if you use this bottom method here, still very thin in comparison to running separate virtual machines. Now, I wanted to talk about terms because as I look at Microsoft documentation, Docker documentation, and really just hear other people talk about containers, we start to use two terms interchangeably and it's a little bit risky because it leads to some misconceptions. Those two terms are images and containers. Let's take a look first of all at an image. Sometimes people will say, let's spin up an image and then make changes to our image or something like that. Well, that's technically not true. Uh, you're using an image to start something else called a container. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but really, the image itself is an immutable file, meaning it doesn't actually change anything. Okay, Even if you're making changes while it's running, that base image never changes. It's read only. Now, what does it contain? It contains source code, libraries, dependencies, tools, you know, all of that basic essential stuff that would have to interact, interact with the operating system in order for that image to actually work, in order for that app to actually work. Conceptually, it's not the same as, don't misunderstand, it's not exactly the same as, but it's conceptually similar to having a snapshot in Hyper-V or a checkpoint, something like that, or even a template if you want to think of it that way. And again, you don't actually run an image, okay? You don't actually run them. What you'll do is you'll copy an image to a runtime container, and then your container is what you're actually going to be running. Now, the image now has, once you've put it in a container, uh, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself here, but the image will now have a writable layer. So let's say that this is my image right here. Uh, and again, it's read only. But once I put it into a container, okay, now it has kind of a read write layer on top of it, and I can make changes to that read write layer. If I make those changes, the image itself still does not change, but what I can do later on is I can kind of take the combination of my changes on this read write layer and the base image itself, and I can spit that out into, <laughs> I'm running out of room here, another image, I'll call it version two, uh, that is now a new immutable file, a new read only file. And if I want to make further changes to that, I'll stuff that into a container also. Okay, so the containers, uh, they're going to be a thin virtualized provisioning environment. It's going to start with whatever's in the image already, which I already discussed. Uh, but it's also going to then have the kernel as well that it needs to be able to run. It includes just enough of the operating system to run an app or a service. Very commonly for Windows, um, we're not really discussing Linux or anything else here, but uh, for, for Windows, you're generally going to have a server core or you're going to have something like the nano server. Uh, usually, you know, if you have nano server, you're talking about a few hundred megabytes. If you're talking about server core. I think that comes out at about five gigabytes. But you think about it, still a lot less storage space than what you would have in a full installation. Uh, they're isolated from other containers and or the kernel itself. So again, you get, you know, really nice isolation out of these. Uh, and it re does require an image in order to exist. So when you start up a container, it has to have an image inside of it. Otherwise, it's a, it's a car without an engine. Now, you may also hear people talk about Docker. Uh, Docker is kind of the central repository of most of these types of images. There's other places you can go as well, but Docker is probably one of the most popular, popular ones. It's an open source software of registry images. A lot of them up there are kind of obscure or things you might not work with very often. There's a lot of Linux images up there as well. There's got, I don't know how many there are, but there's bazillions of them, okay? A bazillion of them. Some of them are also private, so you have to have logon credentials in order to access them. That would be very useful, for example, if I was in a company and we were developing an app that I did not want the public to know about. I only want my other developers to be able to have credentials for. Uh, much is freely available up there. A lot of that stuff is free, and you could just borrow from other people's work, which is really nice, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. And a lot of them, again, are non-Windows machines as well. Uh, now, it's not a Microsoft invention, FYI. 
Uh, we're going to be using it here along with Microsoft products. Uh, so it's not a Microsoft invention, but you can use Docker. And once you've installed it, for example, I can use it to then point to Microsoft's repository uh, at mcr.microsoft.com. I think it's Microsoft Container Registries MCR. And that's where their actual images are going to be stored. Now, the base images that you'll have there, there's a few different choices. And there's some other modifications off of this. But basically, you're going to usually start with these images. First of all, uh, there's Nano Server, which really primarily just gets you the .NET Core. There's a very, very thin operating system. If you don't need anything else fancy, you don't need a lot of the other Windows stack, you know, store, Core is probably going to be good for you. The other thing you could do would be uh, Server Core. That might be useful if you need the .NET framework. So you're going to see probably websites, IIS, installed with Server Core. Uh, we're going to be using that in one of our demos in a future nugget. And uh, that's also a great way to go. These are two probably the most very popular ones. If you're developing, for example, an app or you have an app, that you need to be able to make available to people uh, and it needs more of the Windows full stack, then you can just install Windows. And it's just going to give you the full stack of Windows there. And then uh, if you need Windows Server, that might be useful if you also need to add on to that GPU acceleration. Now, there might be other reasons to also choose one of these images over the other, but these are some of the main things there that I have uh, off to the right of each description. So that's a start on what we're working with here when we talk about Docker, we talk about containers, we talk about images. Stick around for the next nugget where we'll actually start to demonstrate some of this. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from CBT Nuggets. Also, if you're new to IT or are interested in an IT career, visit cbtnuggets.com and sign up for a free trial.